Let me read to you from the um, Declaration of Faith of the International Church of the Foursquare Gospel. Uh, in the, um, it's called their 14th, section 14 of the Declaration, and it refers to divine healing. It says, we believe that divine healing is the power of the Lord Jesus Christ to heal the sick and the afflicted in answer to believing prayer. That he who is the same yesterday, today, and forever has never changed but it's still an all-sufficient help in the time of trouble, able to meet the needs of and quicken into newness of life the body, as well as the soul and spirit, in answer to the faith of them who ever pray with submission to his divine, will, divine and sovereign will. Now, God's sovereign will is, has already been established in his word. One of, the, one of the things we need to always understand is God, God's word is his will. Somehow or another, we think that God can put it in the Bible, we can have the Bible, we can have it written out, and then come along, and somehow or another, God's got a different will than he's already established and spoken. Um, the only time you need to go praying about certain things, about his will, is if you can't find it in the Bible, uh, i.e., um, you're supposed to go to Africa as a missionary. Well, there's no scripture that says, Caps, you're supposed to go to Africa as a missionary. There's not one. There is Bible about missionary, about people going to all the world. There's, about, there's, there's um, uh, examples of people being about, called by the Holy Ghost to go to a different place. Uh, Philip. Philip went into Samaria and preached Christ. People giving heed things which he heard, he said. Amen. Okay, so we have that. We have Philip being pulled out of that city by revival and being led by the Spirit over there to get that one eunuch saved. So we don't have a scripture that says you shall work at, you know, uh, the Center for Creative Leadership here in Greensboro. Well, so when you start praying about a job, you know, am I supposed to take that job there? Well, let's see, you've got to be led by the Spirit. Now, it's going to be in line with the will of God. It's going to be in line with the written word. You just don't have a specific scripture. Now, when you have specific scripture, there's no need in praying about it if it's God's will. You don't need to pray about it if it's God's will if you have specific scripture. The church spends more time praying about is it God's will to do what the Bible's already said he wants to do. And you're really wasting your breath. He's already said it. Amen. So let's look at a couple of things here. Let's look at uh, just the fact that the, the, the divine healing is a reasonable thing. Um, if you look at all the, the scriptures and, and uh, where the Lord healed people and um, so forth and so on, you'll find out it just it seems reasonable. That God uses power not only to save people spiritually when Jesus went to the cross, but he uses power to heal people physically. That may, that's a reasonable argument. Amen. Another reasonable argument is, uh, and I said this to someone recently, you know, w one way you can study out and find out if something is God's will, since Jesus said he was the express will of God, didn't use that exact terminology, he said, I came down not to do my will, but the will of him that sent me. Amen. He said, I only do those things which I see the Father do. And when, when Philip said, uh, Jesus, show us the Father, he said, have I been with you so long and you don't know? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. <clears throat> then, then Hebrews says this, he being the express image of his person. Amen. And so Jesus in ministry is a reflection or a representation of the will of the Father. Is that, is that a reasonable statement? Well, then, let me ask you something. Did you ever see him make somebody sick? Did you ever see him refuse to heal somebody who came in faith? As a matter of fact, when they came out of faith, he, tried, he got them into faith and then got them healed. Isn't that right? Somebody came to him and said, Lord, if you, can't, uh, if you will, you can't make me whole. Now, what that was saying, let me kind of take that out of King Jimmy and put it in the modern language. He says, now, Lord, I know you can, but are you willing? Now, one place, then Jesus answered one place, said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Man, see, people always come and put in on the, putting all the pressure on the Lord, well, not the pressure, but the responsibility on the Lord to do something that they don't know if he'll do it or not. And he'll turn right around and put the responsibility back on you to believe. Why? Because he's already revealed the fact that he will, he's willing. So he said, I will be thou made whole, you know. And so, in other words, you've got to take care... There are a lot of people who would be able to receive from God if they just knew it was his will to do stuff for them. But the church, and let me tell you something, the church has taught a bunch of stupid stuff. Why? To cover up the fact they got no power. 
Hello. You know, we, we see it in our political arena right now. Now, I don't know how somebody did it, but somebody blamed Bush for the, for the failure of the, of the Obamacare thing. I was like, how can you do that? I mean, he's been gone for a long time. I mean, you know, is, is he that powerful? You know, I mean, he, he left in 2009, and he's, and he's to blame for the, you know, for the, for the, 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 the computer failure. Somebody's blaming him. And the, oh, the government shutdown was his fault, too. Now, what is that? That is to defer something, to deflect something. I'm just using that as an example. I'm not trying to say that's right or wrong, and I, you know, I'm taking a political stand. What I'm trying to say is people do things to deflect their failures or their inabilities by blaming somebody else. They, they shirk their responsibility by shifting the blame. See, God, we don't need to shift the blame. Amen. And we don't need to shift the responsibility. I remember a number of years ago, Jesse was, uh, she was in, uh, we, can we get the rest of the lights turned on? It's kind of you know, weird looking out here. Those lights are not on. Hallelujah. Amen. She was playing, uh, she was playing a sport in her school, and, uh, well, soccer. And, and I know this may sound a little crude, but, uh, one of the, the team captain came to, the, came to a game, an away game, and they're riding the bus. And, and at their school, a lot of times they'll have uh, JV, even middle school players on the same bus because they all travel together and they play all their games, you know, back to back to back and that kind of thing. And this, this team captain of the, of the varsity passed out a sheet of paper to all the girls. And on that sheet of paper, it was 10 reasons soccer girls do it better. Now, the, the inference there is crude. They do it on grass, they do it on top of the ball, I mean, all those kind of things. That's, that's, they're, they're just crude. Now, they're, they, what they try, they're kind of trying to come out and say, oh, we're talking about we, we, we play soccer better because we play it on the grass. That's not what they're trying to infer. He, if you're, if you're, just, you're stupid if you think that's what it is. No, they're trying to infer sexual innuendos and so forth. And there's a whole list of those. There's, there's baseball players do it better. So, football, it's all those kind of things, and they're out there. Well, she printed them off, made a bunch of copies, and passed it around. Well, my daughter, being the black and white individual that she is, was not happy about that. Number one, it's the team captain. She's supposed to be the leader. You had kids in there that went to eighth grade getting this stuff. If I was the eighth grade parent, I would have been livid. Some, some upperclassman handed this stuff to my daughter in school and, and then, you know, and, and insinuating that it's okay to think this way and to talk this way and believe this way. <coughs> well, <coughs> so <laughs> we made a... We made a, um, a um, uh, appointment with the coach, like after the game, the next time I saw him. I mean, next day, we were in his, in his face. What's going on here? This is, you know, she, you know, she was involved. And uh, he said, well, well he, he started, and then, and then um, what happened was that the parent of the girl who got in trouble, she ended up getting in trouble, the athletic director and everything, wanted to know who did it. And, of course, they told him. And the next day, my daughter was getting raked over the coals by the whole team. If you've got a problem, you come talk to us. You don't take care of this, this, that, 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 that. And it was all her fault that the other girl got in trouble. No, it wasn't. You know whose fault it was? When she hit print. It, when she hit print, it was her problem. The minute she hit print at home on that computer and printed all those out, it was her responsibility. First of all, going and looking at it in the first place was, was the first mistake. Making copies and printing it was the next one. And then passing it out was the, it's just an ongoing thing. Now, here's what happened. She got ra- railed on and, and pushed and punished by everybody in the world because she did what was right. But see, people who want to defer, will reflect responsibility for themselves and put it on somebody else. Now, I'm, I'm making a point here. Just listen with me. Where did that come from? It came from the devil. See, what the devil does is he'll come and defer and deflect and say, God made you sick for some reason. What does it do? It keeps you from looking at him. See, when you can deflect responsibility from yourself to someone else, even if it's not just that it's on them, then what happens? You fight the wrong battle. Now, instead of the teammates getting together and, 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 and riding the, the, the captain for being wrong, actually, the captain should have, been step, should have been forced to step down, they came after her. And all mad at her and ostracized her and came against her and how can you do such a thing? No, 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 no. See? And then what happened? She, her, her punishment was to carry the ball back for a week. Ooh. Wow. No misplaying time, Nothing. So the coach, you know, and see what happens is the people buy into all this whole mantra. Now, that is a demonic method. Deflection of responsibility is something Satan does. 
And so what he does is he'll deflect, he'll make people sick and then makes people sick and then blame God. Does it all the time. And we get in our pulpits and preach. The Lord had a reason for putting that on them. God has a reason for making them sick. God had a reason for taking your loved one. God had, a, what's that? Satan has just gone and done it and then blamed God. And everybody goes, oh, yeah, it's God's fault. You know, he, he had some special reason. And everybody gets real religious. I mean, I got, I, I had to walk away because I'm, I'm, you know, sometimes you can't fix stupid. But somebody got in a discussion with somebody uh, uh, last year about the fact that Shady Hook, you know, Sandy Hook, whatever it was, it was shady. Massacre, that, you know, God didn't, wasn't responsible for that, and, and God could have stopped it before. No, he couldn't. God just can't step in and intervene in the affairs of man unless someone asks him or prays about it. So my point is, if the church had been doing her job, it wouldn't have happened because people have been praying things out in prayer and, and intervening in intercession. But the church wasn't. It wasn't God's fault. God didn't orchestrate it. God wasn't behind it. And they started telling me basically it was. God had a reason. You know, and, and, you know, sometimes, you know, as a pastor, you can't do things you want to do. Like slap stupid. You know, go blame my father for killing 26 kids, innocent kids, uh, and nobody knows why. Just because he had a reason. Pow! Anyway, I said all that <coughs> because... We have to understand that God's will and it is a sovereign will, but it's sovereign in the fact that he's bound himself to his word. He, you know what God said about his word? I will not alter the thing that's gone out of my lips. That means you can count on the, on the word of God to be stands fast and stand forever. You don't have to go before God saying, well, I know your word says in 1 Peter 2, 24, Isaiah 53, Psalm 103, you know, and, and, and in Malachi, uh, you know, and all the different places all throughout the Bible, you know, the healings bind that you're Jehovah Rapha from Exodus chapter 15, you know, all that belongs to me, but you're sovereign. You can just choose to do what you want to do or not. And so I, 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 you know, I'm not sure if you will heal me, but since you're the sovereign God, you can choose not to do what you said you would do. But God said, I won't change my word. He, he sovereignly bound himself to his, own, to his own word. Now, let's see. Understand this. Being sovereign, he committed himself to his word. Now, does that make sense? In the, you know, it's just like we, you know, we are, we are sovereign people. We're, you know, the United States of America is a sovereign people. And in that sovereignty, they created the Constitution of the United States. Now, I know there's a lot of people who don't believe in it anymore, but it's still the law of the land. It's not even, it's not even like a law that you can go in there and just overturn with a little simple vote. You know what you've got to do to change the Constitution? You've got to have two things, one of two things. You have to have a constitutional convention where representatives come from all the states, and then you, and, and you, you vote. It's still a, like a supermajority, 67%, uh, to change the Constitution. Or you do it by amendment, the amendment process of Congress passing an amendment, and then two-thirds of the states in supermajority pass that same constitutional amendment. It's not easy, and that's 37 states now. You just don't pass an amendment overnight here anymore. Now we've got 50 states. It takes 37 states to, to amend the Constitution. After Congress has voted on it in a supermajority. It's not an easy task. Why? Because, it, because it was, they made it the sovereign law of the land. And everybody believes in the separation of church and state, but they, 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 the same bunch should be believing in the free exercise thereof. Okay? That was a sovereign move, and they established it. Now, you just can't go against that. You can't get a go. I don't believe in the country. We've got people who try it. We've got people using, you know, legislative techniques to try to get around it, but it's still the law of the land. God has sovereignly bound his word. He's not a trickster, and he's not a politician. Hello. He doesn't try to circumvent his word. He, he promises he won't alter the thing that went out of his mouth. Amen? Okay. So, um, let's look at a few things. First of all, God is interested in your body. The welfare and the well-being of your physical body. Amen. Now, somehow or another, we've adopted in the church either... Um, one side of the spectrum that God is only interested in us getting saved and going to heaven and what happens to our body, you know, that's going to pass with us, so it doesn't really matter. Or that God's really only interested in our spirits and it doesn't matter what happens to our body. You know, in other words, it's not that he's just not interested, it just doesn't matter. We can do anything we want to with it. You know, so you get these, these weird swings of, of ideology, uh, uh, ideological uh, perspectives that are totally wrong. Let's read um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We'll quote from this. Uh, if you read from, the, you know, from chapter, verse 9 through 20, 
Let's do that. First Corinthians chapter 6. Know you not the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. Now, that's King James for homosexual. Nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Well, that's what it says. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. You've got to be careful how you interpret. See, but somebody take that out and they say, well, I can do anything I want to because it's lawful for me. It just may not be good for me, but I can still do it. That, that's not what he's saying. He said, meat's for the belly and belly's for the meat, but God shall destroy both it and them. Now, the, <laughs> the next guy that comes up to you and tells you that he's under grace and it's all right if he fornicates, God don't care, just pull out this verse. Now, the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God, hath raised up, and God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies, no, whoa, 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 not your spirits. We know your spirits are a member of the body of Christ. Know ye not that your bodies are members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of an harlot? What's, what's Paul's rhetorical response? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Verse 18. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, and he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Now, fornication is, um, is any type of sexual sin. Now, there's other specific sins that are sexual in nature. Fornication just is a broad, cat, broad stroke against any. Well, what's not sexual sin? In a, in a relationships with your opposite sex spouse in the confines of marriage. End of story. There are no other options. There's no other options. You're mean, you're hateful. No, I'm not. Other stuff will kill you. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that you are, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of, of God, and you are not your own? For you are bought with a price. Listen to this next verse. Next statement. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, he says it. Now, I know we're not, we're not really trying to preach on fornication, but you can't really kind of get around it. You just can't jump in and forget that one in this passage. He says your body and your spirit are God's. Now, we're talking about the reasonableness of divine healing. If God, your body is God's, and the body for the Lord, the Lord for the body, then your body is important. The welfare of your physical body is important to God. Amen. The welfare of your physical body is important to God. There's, that, that passage is strong. You say that's a strong passage of Scripture? There, there's no Mickey Mouse around with that one, is there? Can't, can't manipulate that either. You know? You're, but your, your body and your spirit are God's. Say, my body and my spirit are God's. And so we have here, verse 13 kind of gives us the, this assurance, you know, the body is for the Lord, but the Lord is for the body. Not only is your body to glorify, you use your body to glorify and honor the Lord, he's, he's for your body. He's, in other words, he, he paid a price for your body. He paid a price for your health. The fact that Jesus bore your sicknesses and your sin with the same sacrifice demonstrates that the welfare of the human body is, 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 is equally important to him as the welfare of the human spirit. Now, you may not be able to figure this out, but when you, the Lord returns and the, bodies, and the bodies of men and women are resurrected, you're going to get your body back. And you're going to have it forever. It's going to be a glorified body. When we get to heaven, we're not going to walk up to you and go, who are you? You're going to look like you. 
Janice got the, the glorified version of me. That's right. <clears throat> Why do you think Satan does? Let me just say this. Now, don't get upset with me. You know, if you've, if you've done things in the past, but you know what? Christians run around wanting to get all tatted up, half sleeve, full sleeve, gauges in the ears, tattoos, and stuff through the nose, and all kinds of crazy stuff. Your body was created. The Bible says this. Look, at, look in, in Genesis 1. It says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. So God created him man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him. Now, while this may apply particularly to the spiritual nature of man, the, man, the, the image of God must also have some relation to man's body as well, because Genesis 9 6 says, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed, for it in the image of God made he man. The human physical body looks like your spirit. Doesn't, your spirit doesn't look weird. You know, you don't come out and you got kind of like with these horror movies or the uh, you know uh, uh, Lord of the Rings where they're weird, out of shape things. Okay, your spirit will look like you. Okay, you're made. Your body was made in the image of God. Amen. I said, Amen. Um, death, now death affects, you know, the separation of the human spirit and the soul. But body, but it doesn't kill the soul. We know the rich man and Lazarus. But God said that if you kill somebody, it's, you, you, you know, your blood be shed you, because in the image of God you were made. So the body, the body of man is important to God. We're just we're covering this. And I understand you may think this is real laborious, but it's foundational. I'm telling you, we've got to build faith in people to understand God isn't concerned about your body. He is about your spirit and your soul. Instead of just kind of, you know, well, he'll, he'll, he'll take care of my body. But, you know, he, he loves you. He loves you. And Jesus died. Jesus paid a price to heal you. And it's a slap in his face to say that God don't heal. When he, you know, it's like saying God don't save. The human body is even included in Christ's redemption. Romans 8.23 tells us that we've grown within ourselves waiting for the adoption. That is the redemption of our body. Amen? Well, our body belongs to, to Jesus, to, to God. What? No, you're not. Your body's a temple of the Holy Ghost. You're not, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. Now, people who don't question God's right to claim on your soul and your spirit will turn around and question um, God's, or deny his possession of the body. He, you know, God, God, you're marked with the Holy Ghost. Ephesians said we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Amen? God's interested in both. Your body, as, as a Christian, we read this, talked about this earlier, is a member of, the Christ, of Christ. Know you not that your bodies are members of Christ. He's concerned about your saying. We're, we're kind of covering points out of this, this passage we read. He's concerned about the sanctity of your body, what you do with your body. Now, let me say this. You can't misuse your body and expect it to stay well. That went over big. I said, that one ever big. <laughs> yeah, you, know, you have to take care of your body. Amen? You, have to, you know, and listen, listen, you can't be obsessed, you know. Oh, man, I went outside, you know, and, and, and didn't have a coat on. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to die now because the Lord's not going to heal me. That's no, 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 no. But, you know, God does care about the sanctity of your body. You can't shoot drugs and smoke dope and smoke cigarettes, chew tobacco, drink and get drunk all the time and, you know, and all this kind of stuff, overeat. You can't live at Golden Corral. Well, actually, 184 was pretty good. Yeah. The roast beef was like, like heavenly. The rolls, those, those yeast rolls, put some honey in them. Eat ba 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 Come on, glory to God. But you can't abuse your body and then blame God for you being sick. Hello? That's just, that's, where do we get that from? You know? People go out and do stuff. Now, listen, you know, I, I know this is a really crude, but, you know, uh, STDs were introduced into the, the human population of South America when the Spaniards arrived and engaged in bestiality. We have STDs that are still in the human, human arena today because of, the, they, because of a bestiality. That's abuse of your body. Hello. And, and weird diseases were transmitted into the human population still they don't have cure for it. they can control it but they can't they just don't you know i mean there's, there's the, the results of some of those things are, are devastating sterilization 
all kinds of stuff. Well, that's where it came from. It wasn't, God didn't put that on people. They put it on herself. I, I know y'all, did y'all not read your history books? Didn't have that history. All right. No, that's right. We're, we're the new age people. We're told to do whatever we want to because, you know, we're the generation. If it feels good, do it. You know, and there's no consequence to it or whatever. There is consequence. Can't abuse your body. You can't shoot up with drugs and mainline heroin and expect your body to stay well. Well, we, we used to have somebody went to our church, and they had, a, had an old friend, and they, they, they grew up in church together. This girl had gotten to dating some guy, and he got her hooked on heroin. Now, if you, if you could kind of take, have you ever seen somebody, if you look at them, you go, you know what, if they had 40 pounds on them, they would be just beautiful. But because they'd done heroin so long, they were so emaciated, they looked like skin stretched out on bones. And they could not get free. They could not get free. I mean, they went through all kinds of rehabs, and as soon as they got back out, they went back out and got back, got back on the heroin. I don't even know if they're alive anymore. You see, God didn't do that. You can't shoot heroin and expect to live. Eventually, it's going to get you. Hello? You can't, I mean, I, I, we, we, we knew a guy in our church, back in the church I came out of. We had a guy in there. He'd been married to his wife for, for several years. And he, she didn't know, I mean, you know, of course, if you met her, you'd understand why. I mean, just, you think the elevator stopped on the, on the second floor of a 40-story building. Because how, how could you not know your husband was a homosexual? And she just, she was in shock when she found out. He called us up one day um, <clears throat> because he wanted deliverance, quote. You know, I don't know if he got caught or something she found out, so he wanted deliverance. We went over and prayed for him. Pastor cast the devil out of him, and then I had a word. Here was the word. If you ever go back on homosexuality, you will die. Now, folks, we... So we'll blame God for people being sick with stuff. And God told them not to do it. Don't do it. It'll cost you. See, we, we, we blame God for stuff. The devil puts stuff on people, gets people to do stuff, and then tells them that God did it. But the Lord said, if you ever go back into that, you'll die. Well, a couple years later, he left his wife, went out in full-blown homosexuality. Uh, about four, four or five years later, he called a, a, one of the other guys in our church. That he had, he, that they had been in the same school together or something. He said, I want you to know that I've, I've repented. I've gotten right with the Lord, but I've got AIDS. I've just got a few months to live. I'm dying. Well, I, you know, I'm going to tell you something. You don't rejoice. Now, when you rejoice the fact he got, some, he got things right with the Lord, he repented, he's going to heaven. he's going to go to heaven a lot earlier than he should have. The Lord, the Lord told him, don't do it. The Lord used me. I mean, my pastor called me and said, you remember that so-and-so? Yeah, he's, he's got AIDS. He called so-and-so and told him this. He said, you, you remember what you said that day? And, and I thought, he said, you know, what you're talking about, you know, if you ever went back, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sometimes you forget you said stuff. You just, yeah. He's dying. Well, did God do that? No. God didn't do that. <clears throat> God warned him. Gave him a warning. If you go back into this lifestyle, it's going to cost you your life. Not because God was going to kill him. That lifestyle was going to kill him. He was going to encounter, he was going to encounter a disease they had no cure for. It cost him his life. I said it cost him his life. Now, that, that, that's an extreme, you know, living in sin. How about living in stupidity? We had a rain of student of the year. I was out there dying in the apartments over Christmas. Because he got, he got a, a, a stomach virus and was, was, was having diarrhea and vomiting. And people tried to go, no, you go to the doctor. No, nope, I'm believing God. Go get some relief from the dehydration. It ain't got nothing to do with your faith. You, you know, you've, you've lost extreme amounts of fluids in a short period of time. And that's exactly what he died from. He died from dehydration. And all he had done was gone to the doctor and they could have given him some things to stop the vomiting and so forth and given him some, pedi some, some pedialyte or, or something along those lines that he could drink and replenish his system and he would have lived. God didn't kill him. God didn't put that on him. You know? See, we, that, that's crazy. 
Are you here? I'm believing God. You know, getting some Pedialyte while you're believing God ain't going to hurt you to help you. The body's lost vital nutrients, and you need them. Or Gatorade. You know, go get drink, drink, drink a, quart, a couple of quarts of Gatorade. That's all they had done. But his body, body you, you can't do that, you see. But see, we, we, get, we can get on extremes from sin, or we can get on extremes from being stupid. Well, that's pride. My faith is going to see me through this. And then they could find you in your apartment dead for three days after the Christmas holidays. Hello? I don't know. God cares about your body. We're created in His image. Our bodies are included in redemption. We're part of redemption. I mean, we're part of the body of Christ. He cares about that, and we're in that sanctity thing. Don't you let spiritual pride and spiritual sins and spiritual things cause you to die. A year before I got to Raymond, Brother Hagin was sitting in the class one day over in what's now Rooker Memorial. It was, it was a church auditorium, but it was Rooker Memorial now. And um, there was a guy back at the back. He stopped right in the middle of teaching in class, said, I see a spirit of death hanging over you. He said, now, if you'll come talk to me three times, I can save you. You can, be, you can save you. You won't have to die. Right after class. Now, see, what, what, what's the responsibility? not on Dad Hagen to go chase him down. Who's it on? The per he said, you come see me. You make an appointment to come see me. And you don't have to die. People, classmates went over to him and said, hey, what are you going to do? He said, I ain't going to do a thing. He died before the year was out. Pride. Why are we talking about healing and talking about this? Because these are the things that keep people out of healing. My first, uh, my first um, alumni, we, oh, man. We went, uh, back then, we, we had so many alumni coming back for alumni. We, we would rent the Assembly Center downtown Tulsa for, our, for a banquet on Thursday night. Had a big, big banquet. Dad would come and, you know, we would all eat, and then he would get up and speak. So we're sitting in there in, in uh, I believe, 1982. Had, well, it had to be 1982. And uh, we had an awesome week. We had T.L. Osborne, Kenneth Copeland. I mean, actually, alumni week speakers. Not bad, is it? <laughs> you know? Brother Osborne, wow, say that backwards, wow, <laughs> hallelujah, and, um, and dad, dad's up there talking, and all of a sudden, is, oh, I miss him, I miss his voice in the, in, the, in the body, I can't even fathom how pastor feels, not only was his his spiritual mentor, he was his dad. But you could tell when dad was stepping into the spirit. Just the cadence and the influxes of his voice would change. And he's, he's up there and he's talking and all of a sudden he just stops. And they had the lights out. We had kind of like, you know, lights on the, on the, on the speaker area and everybody's just kind of around at their tables and stuff. He said, there, another year shall come and go. And there are those among you, three among us that will no longer be here, that won't be here. Not that they won't be in the meeting, but they'll be absent from the earth. And he says, it's because you're in adultery and fornication. He said, now, the Lord says, if you'll repent and get that right, you don't have to die. Two of them repented. The third one died. They wouldn't repent. Hope she was good. She must have been something else. I mean, she must have been one hot mama. Hello? Though you get a warning from the Lord. You're sitting in a meeting and the prophet begins to speak. Well, wait a second now. See, God cares about the sanctity of your body. You can't you join yourself into sin. People run around saying there's gay Christians and there's, you know, uh, there's, there's this kind of Christian, that kind of Christian. Well, you, why don't you just have pedophile Christians and, and, um, and uh, bestiality Christians and incest Christians? How about raping Christians? There's no, there's no hyphenated Christian names. I know we do it in the natural about our, our ethnicity in America, which is, well, I'm an American. Well, you know, uh, I'm, an, I'm not an Indian. I'm a Native American. So am I. I was born here. I'm as Native as you are. 
I wasn't born in England and then traveled over. I was born here. If you're born here, you're Native American. Everybody's already separating. They're trying to say, it's a, yeah, they're anarchist Christians, there's liberal Christians, there's conservative Christians, there's bestiality, I mean not bestiality, but, but gay Christians. No, there's not. There's transgender Christians. No, there's not. Why don't you have your fornicating Christian, an adultery Christian, a thieving Christian? All those are sins in the Bible. Hello? You're a pedophile Christian. They can't, let me tell you something, 20 years from now, if something doesn't change, you'll be having people and, and voting and having rights to be a pedophile, and everybody say, well, they were born that way, you can't help it. You say, well, I don't believe it. 50 years ago, you wouldn't believe people were up and having homosexual marriage either, would you? No, it's, it's, it's out there. It's the same devil. I said it's the same devil. See, God cares about the sanctity of the body, and you can't, you can't do things with your body and expect it to be Okay. Boy, it's heavy. I thought, man, we're coming for a healing teaching. Yep. <clears throat> There's a lot of people who don't need a prayer line and don't need a prayer cloth and don't need anointing oil. They need to repent. I'm going to give you some time to think on that one. Hello? Amen. So you, you, won't, you won't forgive? You won't repent? You'll get yourself in trouble. God cares about the sanctity of your body. What you do with your body. Hello? It's important to God. I know you know y'all didn't enjoy a bit of that, did you? We're told... Not only he's concerned about it, but he, he told us to glorify. Uh, verse 20 of that chapter says, Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit with your gods. You're to, have, you're to live your life in a way with your body that, that honors the Lord. Amen. Glory. Then you're to present, you know, what does that mean, live your body? You're to take care of your body. Now listen, I, I'm not a crazy about, you know, you've got you to have ripped abs, you know, and all that kind of stuff. You've got to have a six-pack. I carry a two-liter. Okay? Hallelujah. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not, you can't be obsessed. You can't, you, you'll get people who go off the deep end. Man, if you're not in perfect shape, then you're an abomination to God. Give me a stinking break. And get, body exercise profit for a little while. It's not the number one. Now, you should take care of your body. You should have it, and it should be in d good condition. You don't have to be in you know, Schwarzenegger condition. You can't unless you, unless you use steroids. Arnold Palmer and Lou Ferrigno and all those guys used steroids. They, they, they tell you they did because it wasn't illegal back then. So they were as big as they were because they were juicing. Well, that's bad for you. And I know a lot of guys, people who work out now, they're taking natural steroids. Well, I see, let me tell you something. People, some people, people taking other stuff so they can work out longer and drink a 1,200 uh, calorie, not 1,200, but 1,200 uh, gram carbohydrate drinks and all this kind of stuff. So they have the energy to work out. And then when they come down off that stuff, they're, they're lunatics. They live to work out. Now, I live to serve Jesus. I need to take care of my body. You need to take care of your body. It needs to be taken care of, but you can't be, you can't be lunatic about it either. Just like the guy who, can, who, who goes every moment of every day to the church and never spends time with his wife. That's crazy. Because if you don't, somebody will. I wish I had my bobblehead in here right now. There's some guy has got a big church in America. Just found out about a couple years ago. His wife been having a 10-year affair. Actually, she had one for over five years. He found out about that when she said she wasn't going to do it anymore. And then five years later, found out she was doing it again. And went off, she was doing all kinds of, uh, I mean, I don't know, this really bad stuff. She was really off into the deep end on her sexual side. They put her into it. They put her into an institution for sexual addiction. Where was he? Flying around, getting on television, flying around doing meetings, flying around doing this, always selling his books, always doing something, but he went home with his wife. That went over big. Hello? You can't live like that. I've seen, I've seen too many people do it, and I've seen the results every single time. 
You go out and leave your, you go out and leave your spouse behind. You're out traveling, serving the Lord. So you can get so busy serving God, you forget to take care of your own stuff at home. Brother Bill. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> Brother Bill has the amen voice, you know, for the church. Amen. <laughs> Where was I? Hallelujah. So we're to glorify God with our body. We're to, we're to, you know, we're to, we're to, be, we're to take good care of it. Amen. I can, I, I, we keep getting off on some of this other stuff. Somebody out either there or in here needs to hear what I'm saying. I'm not going to look at you too long. You, know, you might light up and I know it's you. Anyway. <laughs> I can use Jerry. Jerry's a good sport. You're to present your body a living sacrifice. Romans 12, 1 says that we're to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your, King James says reasonable service, but the, but the Greek says re, spiritual service. Note that it's the body, not the soul of the spirit that was to be offered as a sacrifice. God cares about your body. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fiery furnace, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and had changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they might not serve any or worship any God except their own. They were, they were willing to put their bodies up on the sacrifice plate not to deny the, the God, not to deny their faith. Amen? We glorify God with our body. We offer our bodies as sacrifices. We keep our bodies in a position of honoring the Lord. You need to honor the Lord with your body. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. And then another point under here, the fact that, that, um, that man was created in God's image is the body will be resurrected. Hallelujah. The resurrection is real. Amen? Glory to God. My God. Hallelujah. Well, listen, real quick. There's a vital relationship between the, the soul and spirit of man and his physical body. Things that affect your soul will affect your body. We know that a lot of people are sick because they worry too much. Worry will make you sick. Stress will make you sick. Isn't that right? Lack of exercise will depress you. There is a unique relationship between the body of man and his spiritual soul, spirit and soul. God made us that way. So that means we need to take care of it. Keep it in harmony. Keep them both well. Amen? Glory to God. And man's needs are two, twofold. When Adam sinned, both the spirit of man fell and his body fell. And this is going to kind of lead into next week because sin was not, sickness was not in the earth until sin was in the earth. Man was not sick until he sinned. Now, I know, and we're, we're going to get into this next week. I'll just leave you here because I don't want you going home thinking about it all week and devil getting a... Sickness is here because of sin, but it does not mean if you were sick, you sinned. Sickness is here now because you sinned, but it doesn't mean that you sinned is why you're sick. The, door, the gateway into humanity's bodies for sickness was the fact that man sinned in the garden. It opened the door. And then man became subject, carnal, death doomed, to sickness. Now, if you get, if the cold comes by and you got the sniffles, didn't mean you were out, you know, shooting up last week. Now, if you were shooting up last week, you need to stop. But see, you now when the devil comes to you, when you hear something like I'm just saying right now, they go, ah, oh, what, you've got some secret sin. You don't even know what it is. That's the way it always goes. Is you don't even know what it is. It's a secret sin. It's like my Pentecostal church. We, before we took communion, Lord, if I've done anything wrong, and I don't, and I don't know if I have, but if I have, forgive me. Because we were told, man, if you, if you drink unworthy, you're going to die. And I didn't feel like being drugged out of the church. Like Ananias and Sapphira. So you're over there repenting. You can't even enjoy the communion table with the Lord because you're repenting for stuff you didn't even do. Hello? Well, that's not how you're supposed to live. But if there is sin there, you get it straight. And listen, if your heart condemns us not, we have confidence toward God. You know if you've done something wrong. You knew it when you did it. Don't let some lame brain tell you that you don't need to get, deal with it. Deal with it. Stay well. Amen? And we'll pick up next week with the origin of sickness. 